Welcome back to World Religions, a video series to accompany a semester-long survey of World Religions class, specifically with the textbook A Short Introduction to World Religions, edited by Christopher Partridge. Part 6, Jainism. We're going to discuss this South Indian religion, uh, including these five chapters. 25, Historical Overview. 26, Sacred Writings. 27, Main Beliefs. 28, worship and festivals, and 29, Jainism in the modern world. Chapter 25, Historical Overview. The religion Jainism is named after the Jinas, which is a word that means conqueror. These are enlightened beings who have conquered samsara, the cycle of life, death, and reincarnation. The Jain belief in samsara, uh, which is based on karma or action, is similar to that of Hinduism and Buddhism. The Jinas are also called Tirtankaras or Ford Makers. This is in reference to the idea that they provide a passage or a crossing uh, over the flood, metaphorically, of samsara. So in both Jainism and in Buddhism, you see the same metaphor, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, samsara, compared to a flooding river or body of water that can sweep away um, uncautious souls. So the Tirtankaras, they provide a way to cross this dangerous flood safely. Um, in Jainism, Jinas and Tirtankaras are regarded as having attained omniscience or Kevala Gyana, and as having conquered samsara. So these beings are free of samsara, they have no more karma on their souls, and they are in a liberated uh, state of existence. So historically, the religion was founded by Mahavira, who's regarded by Jains as the 24th and last of the Jinas of the current age, basically. Um, the next Jina is not scheduled to be reborn until the third phase of the next half cycle. And this is a reference to the Jain belief in the cosmic cycle. So time goes through a cycle of 12 phases and then repeats. The 12 phases are divided into two halves, each of six phases in length. Six of the phases, the first half, are progressive or ascending and six of the phases are regressive or descending, where suffering and sin are increasing. And there are 24 genas in the third and fourth phases of each half of this cycle. So this is kind of like a universal pattern that repeats endlessly. You can see in the picture a murti or image of Mahavira. Many other genas are depicted the same way as men who are not wearing clothing, seated in meditation posture. Um, you can tell this one is Mahavira because of the lion symbol at the base. Also, you can see the two swastikas. Those are symbols of good fortune or blessedness in Jainism and also in other Indian religions like Hinduism. The Jains are divided into two main sects, Digambara and Shwedambara. In Digambara Jainism, all the Jinas are regarded as male. But in Shwedambara Jainism, the 19th Jina of the last cycle is regarded as having been a woman named Malanat. As mentioned, there are two main sects of Jainism, uh, each of which has several sub-sects, you could say, of its own. These are Digambara and Shwedambara. Um, these gradually evolved apart in the centuries following the death of Mahavira, the founder of Jainism. Digambara means sky-clad, i.e. not wearing any clothes. This sect is more common in southern India. Shwedambara means white-clad, i.e. wearing white clothes, and is prominent in northwest India. The Digambara monks or ascetics do not wear clothing as part of their renunciation of worldly goods, whereas Shwedambara monks or ascetics do wear special seamless white robes. You can see in the picture Acharya Vidyasagar, who's a Digambara monk. 
Um, so the formal split between these sects was not until the 5th century AD. This was as a result of the Council of Vallabi, which was a Shwedambara giant council convened to determine their canon of officially recognized sacred scriptures. Um, as a result of the fact that this council was only binding among Shwedambara giants and not Digambara giants, who have a different set of scriptures, um, this uh, council effectively cemented or sealed the formal split between the two main sects. The historical founder of Jainism is known as Mahavira by Jains. He is the 24th and most recent of the Jinas. Now Mahavira is generally accepted as historical by scholars, unlike most of the earlier Jinas. Uh, he lived in Bihar in Northeast India in the 6th or 5th centuries BC. He was probably an older contemporary of the Buddha who lived in the 5th century BC, according to most modern scholars. Many scholars also believe that the 23rd Jina Parshva was a historical person who lived in Varanasi around 250 years before Mahavira. Thus, it is entirely possible that Jainism was not completely founded by Mahavira, that he may have been reforming or continuing or reviving an older tradition. And it certainly is possible that the Jain belief in the soul and karma and reincarnation was not invented by Mahavira out of whole cloth. So a bit more about the life of Mahavira. So it's believed that he lived and taught near Patna in Bihar. This is in the northeast of India. Uh, it was the political center of a lot of dynasties in the north um, during and after the time of Mahavira. He was a part of this larger movement in Indian culture, ancient Indian culture, that started around the 500s BC called the Shramana movement. Shramanas, literally strivers, were groups of ascetics, people who renounced their worldly attachments to try to find salvation, uh, enlightenment, spiritual liberation or freedom. They had different sects and different theories about the nature of reality, different soteriologies, theories of salvation, different theologies, etc. Some were Jain, some were Buddhist, some were Hindu, some like the Ajivikas followed other traditions, many of which have now died out. But uh, Mahavira decided to emphasize this life of ascetic renunciation. So he rejected Hinduism, or the ancient version of it, which was religion based on the Veda and the rituals performed by the Brahmins or priests. So the date of Mahavira's death is generally given by scholars at around 425 BC. He's believed to have died at the age of 72, but Digambara giants uh, place his death at 510 BC, whereas uh, Shwedambara giants place his death around 527 BC. So giants believe that in the life of Mahavira, as well as that of any other Jina, there are five auspicious or blessed moments. The conception of Mahavira, the birth of Mahavira, when as a young man he renounced the world and became an ascetic, his enlightenment or Kevala Gyana, and his state of liberation or moksha. The state of liberation is attained after his soul, shed, soul sheds his body, whereas the enlightenment, uh, which gives omniscience or all-knowingness and the end of suffering um, happens while he's still alive. And after the enlightenment or Kevala Gyana, he has his ministry or teaching about the truths of the religion, what is uh, liberation and how to attain it. So a bit more about the birth of Mahavira. This is described in the Jain scripture called the Kalpa Sutra. Um, the past life of Mahavira was actually as a heavenly being, so a divine being living in the heavens. In Jainism, like in Hinduism and Buddhism, there are heavens and hells, but they are not generally eternal. A soul can be born in a heaven, but it will not dwell there forever. 
heaven is just part of samsara, the cycle of reincarnation. Although heavenly lives, heavenly incarnations do last for a long time compared to a normal human life. But the god, the deva Indra, who also is a god in Hinduism, arranged for Mahavira to be transported to his mother's womb. This is part of his cosmic role as a savior, as a jina. Now, even though Indra is a part of Jainism, as are some other gods from the Veda, the Hindu scriptures, in Jainism, they don't focus on worshiping Indra or other gods. So Indra and other gods, they can be helpers of the jinas, and so they can have a kind of reflected glory, if you will. But the gods are not the same necessarily as the jinas or as the liberated beings who've attained moksha. So they are not the main focus of Jainism. Although Jains do sometimes worship gods like Indra, they are second fiddle to the jinas uh, like Mahavira. Mahavira's mother was named Trisala, and she was born into the Kshatriya or noble caste. Um, so Jainism starts in India like Hinduism, and so the Varna or caste system is a part of the social reality. What's interesting is that according to Jain belief, all of the Jinas are born to Kshatriyas or nobles, not to Brahmins or priests. And this is probably connected to the fact that in Jainism, they don't regard the Brahmin Varna or caste as having special spiritual authority, unlike in Hinduism, where the Brahmins are the only ones authorized to interpret the Veda and perform its rituals. So Jainism, it does have some elements in common with Hinduism, like the belief in karma and souls and reincarnation and liberation, but Jains reject the Veda and they reject the authority of the Brahmins or priests. So a big difference there. Now, according to the Shwedambara version of the story of Mahavira's birth, he was first mistakenly taken to the womb of a Brahmin woman before being redirected to his actual intended mother, Trisala. And that's just kind of highlighting or underlining the fact that even though in Hinduism, religious teachers or saints are often born into the Brahmin or priestly class, that is not so in Jainism. So who was Trisala? She was the wife of a powerful king named Siddhartha. Now, Siddhartha is also the given or birth name of uh, Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism. But it was a fairly common name that would have been used by Kshatriyas in ancient India. Uh, Siddha, the first part of the name, means power. Artha, the second part of the name, means success. So it is a name that would be appropriate for a king whose parents intended him to be strong and powerful. While Trisala was pregnant with Mahavira, though, she had 16 auspicious or good fortune dreams. Um, and the particulars of the dreams were interpreted as signs that her son would either be a great king, essentially the emperor of the world, or a great spiritual teacher who would save humans from samsara and suffering. And of course, he ended up being the latter. Um, there's kind of a parallel in that story of Jainism and in Buddhism with the auspicious signs that surrounded the birth of the Buddha, um, although the details vary. So when Mahavira was born, humans and gods rejoiced. So there's this kind of cosmic or universal role being played by Mahavira. And the god Indra is said to have taken him and anointed and consecrated him on Mount Meru. In ancient Indian belief, Mount Meru is a sacred mountain at the center of the universe, the base of which is in the human realm, but it ascends up to the realm of the heavens. So um, when he was born, he wasn't called Mahavira. That was a later title given to him after he attained enlightenment. So his given name was actually Vardhamana, which means increasing. The title or special name Mahavira actually means great hero. Mahavira eventually, when he became a young man, became an ascetic or renunciate. So he renounced his privileged status as a kshatriya or noble. Now, according to the Digambara version of the story, Mahavira never married, never had any children. But the Shwedambaras tell it a bit different. 
Mahavira married a princess named Yasoda as a young man who bore him a daughter. Um, at the age of 30 is when he started his spiritual quest. He was called by the gods, the devas, to realize his destiny as a jina or liberated being. He was initiated by the gods as an ascetic. He renounced all of his worldly possessions and he even pulled the hairs from his head, which is still practiced by giant ascetics today at their initiation. So this is just an example of the types of asceticism or um, practices of self-denial, of renunciation, sacrificing worldly attachments that were common among various sects of ascetics in ancient India. For example, the Ajivakas would also typically renounce all their clothing and go around without any hair on their head. Um, so he just wandered around um, meditating and uh, trying to understand the nature of the soul or self for many years, had no possessions. Now there's also a split between the Digambara and Shwedambara about the garments of Mahavira, because according to the Digambara, Mahavira did not wear any clothing from the very beginning. And this is reflected in their practice of monks or ascetics going about entirely naked. Whereas in the Shwedambara tradition, they said that Mahavira originally was wearing a white robe, but it was caught on a bush and he was too deep in contemplation or meditation to notice. So they do agree with the Digambara that later on he didn't have the white robe, but originally he did. And they use this to justify their practice of their ascetics wearing white robes to this day. So like many other ancient traumas, um, the practice of asceticism involved begging for food. So this is being dependent on alms or the offerings of pious lay people. And the idea is the ascetic shouldn't uh, earn their own food, shouldn't have a job or wealth or property. Rather, they're giving up all those things. And so the only way they can survive is through the kindness or generosity of lay people. And the general way this worked is that the ascetic would give a blessing in exchange for food and lay people would regard it as something good, as good for them spiritually to give offerings to these people trying to live a pure or liberated existence. Although there are also tales of Mahavira being abused by the people he encountered. Um, there are more recent saints in India that have similar stories. For example, of um, I believe it was Ramakrishna who told some stories of when he first became an ascetic. This would have been in India in the 1800s. He left his village. He was just meditating out there um, at the remote parts of uh, of the land, but if kids would come upon him, they might throw rocks at him and to taunt him, even though he was just trying to stay still and focused. So similar types of things happened to Mahavira and probably to other ascetics throughout history as well. Nevertheless, he persisted. He practiced extreme nonviolence, not killing or harming any living creature, even animals, even small insects. He fasted for very long periods, which is still an important practice of Jainism, and he meditated continually on the nature of the self or soul, which is called Jiva or Atman in Jainism. So Mahavira's enlightenment happened after 12 and a half years of devoted practice. And that just goes to show how in the Jain view, it's not usually easy to become enlightened. It could take many lifetimes, or even if you are destined to become enlightened, like Mahavira, years and years of devotion to this lifestyle. And uh, many giants, most giants now believe it's no longer possible to become perfectly enlightened because of the decline of the age, but it is possible to make progress and to have a better rebirth. Um, and eventually given the change in cosmic cycles from there, it will be possible to attain um, enlightenment and liberation. So the word that's translated as enlightenment is usually in um, Jainism, Kevala Gyana, which means aloneness or separation, Kevala, and knowledge, Gyana, specifically a spiritual knowledge thought of in Jainism as a type of omniscience, just having complete knowledge of the nature of reality. And it's called aloneness or separation because the soul in this state is separate from and purified from matter, everything that is not self, not soul. And the Jain view, which we'll talk about more later, 
is that karma and other types of matter, they stain the soul. They get on the surface. They are like dirt covering the soul and they obscure its true nature. So it's actually good for the soul to be alone or separate from those impurities. So after he attained this enlightenment, uh, he got rid of all of the karma, all of the dirt on his soul. He had perfect knowledge. He preached uh, for a period of several decades. He preached at the center of large assemblies or some of a Saranas of animals, humans, and gods. And there's even a story told by giants that he always would face the east, but the gods would create faces for him in all four directions. The Digambara giants also say that during his sermons, Mahavira's body would emit a Divyadvani or divine sound, which his chief disciples would then translate for the audience. Uh, so according to giants, he had 11 chief disciples. The first three were Brahmins who were all brothers, Indrabuddhi Gotama and his brothers Agnibuddhi and Vayubuddhi. And these were all converted to become followers of Mahavira after he defeated them in debate. So they are originally Brahmins, they were priests, they were ritualists who followed the Veda, but after being bested by him, um, they joined his sect and let go of their status as Brahmins. And these three brothers, together with eight more Brahmins, were the chief disciples. Um, they all attained enlightenment, or Kevalagyana, and had disciples of their own. According to the Jains, the original community of Mahavira's followers consisted of 36,000 nuns, or female ascetics, 14,000 monks, or male ascetics, 318,000 lay women, and 159,000 lay men. It's interesting to see that there were more nuns than monks and more lay women than men initially. Um, and if I had to speculate, it's because in Jainism, there's a notion that women can become ascetics and can become fully enlightened and liberated, uh, at least according to some Jains. And that is a, a special spiritual status that women don't have in Hinduism in that in Hinduism, um, there are women saints, but only male Brahmins are allowed to serve as priests or clergy. And the vast majority of the Hindus regarded as saints or liberated people are men, whereas there's a special provision made in Jainism for female ascetics. And so that may have made the religion more attractive to women in antiquity. So in Jainism, the focus is on the ascetics. They are the ones who renounce the world and thus the ones who are capable of attaining enlightenment, kevalagyana, and moksha or liberation from samsara. But they are only possible through the actions of lay people who give them alms, food, and other support. Um, so the lay Jains have a very important role to play as well. They also have a code of conduct. They also have to practice strict nonviolence, including vegetarianism, not allowed to kill or eat animals. Um, and we have ancient inscriptions going back to the first few centuries AD that show um, traders and craftsmen giving alms to giant ascetics. Uh, and apparently, originally, all of the ascetics were wanderers, so they would wander around teaching the religion. They didn't have a permanent home, a permanent dwelling place, but that eventually changed. So by the 5th century AD, there were also halls uh, created for giant ascetics, although these were generally paid for and constructed by lay people. The word Acharya in Jainism means a teacher, and it's often used as a title, a word of respect for very influential or important teachers. By the 11th century AD, um, Jainism, including within each of the two main sects, Digambara and Shwedambara, had evolved into separate communities of ascetics, each led by their own Acharya. Uh, according to uh, Shwedambara Jains, an Acharya's religious authority is based on a lineage that goes back specifically to Sudarman, one of Mahavira's main disciples. Um, an example of a very influential Shwedambara Acharya was uh, Himachandra, who lived from 1088 to 1172. 
He was a philosopher, a historian, a poet, a grammarian. He's regarded as the father of the Gujarati language, which is a Northern Indian language derived from Sanskrit, because he was the first to write a formal grammar for it. He also helped end the state-sponsored animal sacrifices that were practiced in Gujarat and probably had an influence on later traditions of Hindu vegetarianism and opposition to animal sacrifice in that region as well. So there was a very long history of Jainism, but the important theme is that it was supported by some ancient Indian kings and dynasties, and that's probably one of the main reasons why it survived. If you go back to the 500s BC, there were uh, probably dozens of different important sects of shramanas or spiritual movements or schools of philosophy, and the main ones that survived, like Jainism and Buddhism, they had at least a relatively long period of support by kings in India. So, for example, there was an ancient king uh, called Srenika by Jains or Bimbisara by Buddhists of the kingdom of Bihar. This is the region in the northeast around where uh, Mahavira was living, who gave support for Mahavira and early Jains. Uh, he also gave support to the Buddha um, as well. And that was a fairly common thing, too. Um, ancient Indian kings wouldn't necessarily only give to one religion or one sect. They sometimes would give to several different sects, maybe Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist, uh, maybe even others, all of which they regarded as meritorious or acts of good karma, of generosity. Later on, during the Nanda dynasty, there were a series of pro-Jain kings. They also were ruling from Bihar. Um, an even larger empire was created by the Mauryas, um, you can see the empire at the height uh, around 250 BC in the map on the slide, specifically um, Chandragupta, so one of the founders of the Maurya dynasty, he supported Jainism especially. Um, and King Vanaraja was a later king, this is in the AD period, so about a thousand years after the Mauryas, he actually promoted Jainism as the state religion, and he had been raised by a Shwedambara ascetic who influenced his judgment in that regard. And there were some later uh, series of kings in Gujarat who also promoted Jainism, especially under the influence of the Acharya Himachandra, who served as the court scholar to two kings of Gujarat, namely Jaya Simha Siddharaja and Kumarpala. Now, uh, Kumarpala specifically tried to rule according to Jain principles. He took vows as a Jain layman, he lived as a vegetarian, and he outlawed animal sacrifice and slaughter, and built uh, giant temples as well, such as Taranga Hill in Gujarat. There were also dynasties in southern India that supported Jainism. The western Ganga dynasty ruled in part of what's now the state of Karnataka, and they came to power with the help of Siman. Nandi, who was himself a Jain ascetic. Uh, so specifically, they supported Digambara Jainism, which is connected to southern India. Um, other dynasties were the Rashtrakutas, who ruled in the Dechen Plateau in south central um, India. It's a kind of um, highland region in central India. And the Hoysala dynasty, in, also in Karnataka, but later after the western Ganga. So um, this was kind of like the golden age of Jainism up to the early, um, a little after the first millennium AD, but starting in the 1200s and after, you get basically the end of serious royal patronage of Jainism. And the religion went into relative decline. Um, there were Muslim dynasties uh, established by invaders from the north and west. Um, Hinduism revived, there was a powerful devotional or bhakti Hindu movement focused on devotion to gods and goddesses like Vishnu, Shiva, and Durga or Kali, uh, other goddesses too. Uh, Jainism never completely went away, but it didn't have the same prominence that it did in ancient India. Jainism um, in its first few centuries also spread uh, out from its original heartland. So the original heartland was in the city of Putna or Pataliputra in Bihar, and it spread first to the west and then also to the south, and eventually it mostly actually died out in the northeast in the heartland and survived in western and southern India. 
So part of the reason why it spread to the West was because a lot of the main supporters of Jainism were merchants or traders, and there was a caravan or trade route going to the West from a Putna or Pataliputra. So by 100 BC to 100 AD, the city of Mathura was an important giant center in the West. And uh, in the fourth century AD, some giants traveled further West to the city of Vallabhi. Um, it, this may have been partly for political reasons as well to escape the Gupta empire, but also maybe to explore more trade opportunities for the West. Um, so the Western route basically gave rise to the later Shwedambara sect, which is prominent in the states of Gujarat, Rajasthan, and the Punjab. Whereas in the South, there was a different trade route, a different caravan route, leading to Orisha, Chennai, and Mysore. So uh, we see early evidence of giants there going back to the second century BC. There are some giant inscriptions in the city of Kalinga. So this was the became the heartland of the Digambara sect in the states of Maharashtra and Karnataka. And um, there's only uh, four to five million giants in India. I mean, it's a very large number, a tiny percentage of the total population. But they're mainly concentrated in some of those western states and some of those southern states today. So uh, according to the giants, Mahavira was survived by his disciples, Indrabuddhi Gotama and Sudarman. So Indrabuddhi Gotama is also called Gotama Swami. Initially, his enlightenment was actually blocked by his attachment to his own guru, his own teacher, Mahavira, because he was distraught after Mahavira's death. But it didn't take him long to right the ship, so to speak, and attain enlightenment. Just a few hours after the death of Mahavira, he realized the truth of Mahavira's moksha or spiritual liberation. So he was able to end his distress and his attachments to Mahavira and became enlightened right then and there. So um, there's this Hindu festival, Diwali or Dipavali, and it's also celebrated by Jains. But in Jainism, Diwali uh, marks the occasion of both Mahavira's moksha and Indrabuddhi Gotama's enlightenment, or Kevala Gyana. The other, uh, one of the other important disciples of Mahavira was Sudarman, and he actually succeeded Mahavira as leader of the ascetic community. He also attained enlightenment. His successor was Jambu, who also attained enlightenment. But according to modern Jains, it is no longer possible to attain enlightenment after Jambu because um, of the overall spiritual decline of the age. There is that giant notion of the cosmic cycle. So John Bu had direct access to the teachings of Mahavira. Later, subsequent giants did not. And so that's why the kind of path to enlightenment is no longer fully open. Although giants basically believe um, there are still pathways it will just take a little longer or you may have to be reborn in another realm that's outside of the cosmic cycle and then from there you can attain enlightenment um the textbook notes that enlightened people in jainism are regarded as omniscient so by denying that it's possible currently for giants to become enlightened they don't have to kind of test that hypothesis to prove that they are omniscient or all-knowing but you do see this concept of the path to enlightenment no longer being open in Buddhism as well because of the decline of the Dharma. And it's also similar to the Hindu notion of the Kali Yuga or the age of darkness um, and decline that we now live in. Originally, all Jain ascetics were wandering like Mahavira. They wandered between different villages and different towns teaching the truths of their religion. They didn't have a permanent dwelling, and that was part of their renunciation of the world. But by the 4th century AD, many Jain ascetics lived in permanently constructed monasteries, so they were sedentary or non-wandering ascetics. In Shwedambara Jainism, sedentary monks are called Chaityavasi, or temple dwellers. And uh, temple dwelling ascetics, for their part, have even questioned the validity of wandering ascetics and claimed that their way is actually superior. They have preserved the religion by maintaining giant temples. And it's true that for many lay people's parts, that's their main encounter with Jainism is by going to temple. 
Um, there have been various reforms of Jainism over the centuries. In general, reformed Jains tend to regard the temple dwelling or sedentary monks as lax or irreligious, as not living up to the precepts of Mahavira or the original teaching. Uh, Jinasvara Suri in the 11th century AD was one such reformed ascetic, and according to the histories, he defeated in debate a temple dwelling ascetic in 1024 in Patan, Gujarat. There is a strong tradition of theological or religious debate in Jainism, um, and there's sort of rules of, of logic and of rhetoric that help determine the winner, quote unquote. But uh, Lonka Shah was a 15th century layman from Gujarat. He established the Lonka Gacha, which opposed temple dwelling monks, temples, and images or murtis. So most Jains, they actually do uh, worship uh, images or murtis, whether of jinas or other beings in their temples. But there are some Jains, like those of the Lonka Gacha, who eschew those images uh, because that was not a practice that was actually taught originally by Mahavira. There's an additional type of Jain clergy called a Bhattaraka or Venerable One, and these are non-ascetic clergy. Their evolution um, was kind of a historical development. Um, they're not mentioned in the original Jain scriptures, for example. Rather, they emerged with the rise of temple-based Jainism to help manage the temples, the rituals, um, manage the uh, living arrangements for the temple-dwelling ascetics. Um, they took uh, lay vows, they managed libraries and religious education of lay people. Um, and they also served as a political role. They were liaisons between the Jain community and other religions and political authorities. So they would negotiate political protection for Jains and promote Jainism through education and publications. Um, many of these Bhattarakas no longer exist. Um, there were 36 seats um, or offices of Bhattarakas in India. Most of them are now vacant or obsolete. Uh, and many Jains came to regard them as illegitimate because they're not ascetic clergy and Mahabira himself only authorized or created the order of the ascetics. But an example of a modern Bhattaraka uh, is uh, Lakshmi Sena, who you can see in the picture. Uh, and he presides at the Mel Sitamur Jain Mat in Tamil Nadu, India. Chapter 26, Sacred Writings. The Jain scriptures are different for the two main sects, the Digambaras and Shwedambaras. Um, there are some Jain scriptures that go back to antiquity, but unfortunately, many of the original Agamas the ancient giant scriptures were lost. They were transmitted orally for many centuries, but for some reason, perhaps connected to the decline of Jainism in its original heartland in the Northeast, or for other uh, political reasons, um, if giants had to move or flee because they were persecuted, there was a break in the oral transmission. The earliest texts were written in Ardhamagadi, which was a Prakrit or dialect um, derived from Sanskrit. So this would have been a relatively local uh, language from northeastern India. Later on, many of the scriptures became written in Sanskrit, which was an older form of the language, but the one used in scholarship throughout India by many different religions, including Hindus and Buddhists, as well as Jains. So an example of um, an ancient Jain scripture is the 12 limb basket. This is actually the collection of the oral recensions of Mahavira's teachings compiled by each of his 11 disciples. Um, the current scriptures, as I said, are different for Shwedambara and Digambara giants. The Shwedambara giants have their own established canon, so they have official lists of which texts are authoritative, and they believe that their scriptures do descend directly from the original ancient 12 limb basket. Um, scholars would uh, question the, some of the connections, but they do agree that both the Shwedambara and Digambara teachings have a connection to the original teachings of Mahavira. Um, neither one of them just, you know, made things up out of whole cloth, so to speak. The Digambara believe that the original Jain canon was lost by the 2nd century AD, 
Um, they don't actually have an official canon of their own. They do have lots of scriptures that they use, but there isn't an official list of what is canonical and what is not. And some Digambaras accept the authority of some of the Shwedambara scriptures. Um, so the current giant canon or collection of texts is something that was composed by many different authors over several centuries, but they are regarded by Jains as reflecting Mahavira's original teachings. The picture on the slide is a diagram of the original Agamas. So first let's talk about the Digambara canon. So only two parts of it are believed to be ancient. Um, the Shat Khandagama, or scripture of six parts, which contains recollections of an ancient giant ascetic named Darasena, and the Kashiya Pahuda, or treatise on the passions, which was composed by the ascetic Gunabhadra. These are both very important, though. They discuss the soul, its bondage to karma, and its liberation from samsara, which is the essence of a giant teaching. Um, so the later scriptures were composed mainly by ascetics uh, over several centuries and later compiled. The Digambaras do not have an official canon, unlike the Shwedambaras. So um, they do divide their scriptures, though, into four main parts, or Anuyogas, which means um, expositions. The first one is the Pratmanuyoga, or um, this is the historical text that contain the origins of Jainism and society, including the universal history. Um, which has the lives of Mahavira and other genus. The second exposition is the Karanana Yoga or cosmological texts. The third is the Charanana Yoga or codes of conduct for ascetics and lay people. And the fourth is the Dravyana Yoga or metaphysical works, also some devotional hymns. The Shwedambara are the sect that have an official canon. Even though we talk about the Digambara canon, um, we use the word more loosely because the Digambara um, don't have that official list. The Shwedambara were able to establish official lists of the sacred scriptures in a series of three councils. Although we don't actually have uh, the records of the decisions of those councils, but that is believed to be the origin of the tradition of their canon. So at these three can councils, um, the uh, Shwedambara ascetics gathered and they recited what they could remember of the original oral tradition. These were recorded and collated into the textual scriptures. The first council was in the city of Putna. So this was uh, in and around where Mahavira lived 160 years after his death. The second council was at Mathura in the northwest and uh, in Balabi in further to the west, 827 years after the death of Mahavira. Um, so there were two different lists of scriptures that were created, and the Shwedambara basically accept the version at Mathura, so that became canonical for them. The third and final Shwedambara council was at Balabi. Uh, around 400 to 450 AD. And this was the last of these uh, canonical councils. It closed the Shwedambara canon, and it also solidified the break between Shwedambara and the Digambara giants, thus creating the formal schism. Um, so the Shwedambara canon contains many texts, but they are in three main groups. Purva refers to the lost scriptures, which both Digambara and Shwedambara regard as canonical. It's just that most of them are no longer known. The second group is the 12 angas or limbs, and only the 12th of those is lost. And the third group is everything else, various subsidiary texts authored by later ascetics, i.e. they're not claimed to be authored by Mahavira or one of his disciples. Now, not all Shwedambaras accept all of those texts as authoritative because some of them approve of the use of images or murtis. There are some sects of Shwedambara Jains the Stonic Vasi and the Terapanthi that are opposed to worshiping images or icons or idols and temples. And so they reject the scriptures that countenance such practices. So a famous uh, Jain scripture is Tatvarta Sutra. Tatvarta means that which is. So this is the sutra, the thread or discourse about existence. It's in Sanskrit. And it's accepted by both Digambaras and Shwedambaras. 
Um, the details of it are specific to Jainism, and I'm not going to go over the full analysis of existence, but this structure is what is interesting. It's an attempt to classify all the different types of existence, including the various types of consciousness and the various types of matter. In that regard, it parallels the Sankhya analysis of Hinduism and certain texts of the Buddhist Abhidharma or further teaching. Um, the author of the Tattvarta Sutra was Umasvati, who lived in the 4th to 5th centuries AD. What's interesting is he's claimed by both Digambaras and Shwedambaras as being a member of their sect, but we don't know which he was. Um, so another important teaching um, of Jainism is the three jewels of Jainism. This expresses the essence of the Jain path to moksha, correct faith, correct knowledge, correct conduct. Um, this is worth mentioning, um, not only because it's an important part of the religion, but because you find a parallel to this in Buddhism and also in Hinduism. There's often these lists of three important things that are worshipped or revered. In Buddhism, it's the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Um, in Hinduism, there is the Trimurti, or the three images of Brahman, the Supreme Being. There's also the Trident, or Trizula, that's associated with Shiva, which has three points. So you get the idea. It's not to say that all three of these religions are the same. They're not. They have different theologies, different soteriologies, but they do have some similarities in their structure of concepts and some of their iconography. The Jain attitudes to scripture were traditionally that only ascetics should study them, not lay people. The belief is that people without ascetic discipline like fasting or renunciation, uh, if they studied the scriptures, they might interpret them wrongly. It could even be spiritually harmful for them. So instead, lay people would be taught the scriptures by ascetics and they would also be exposed to it in the liturgy. But there were many devotional texts written by lay people in their vernacular languages in different parts of India over the centuries, and those have been incorporated into the canonical scriptures used today by Digambaras and Shwedambaras. Nowadays, also, attitudes are a bit more open to lay people studying certain giant scriptures, but there are also many texts that are only studied by ascetics. The picture is of the Nirvana or liberation, moksha of Mahavira from the Kalpa Sutra, which is one of those historical texts giving a history life of Mahavira and also of other things too. Chapter 27, Beliefs. So the core beliefs of Jainism are about the soul, the nature of the soul, its bondage and its liberation. So every living creature, um, plants, animals, humans, and others, has a soul called a jiva or an atman that is trapped in samsara. Samsara is the cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. It's regarded as a trap for a variety of reasons. Uh, for one thing, it's always associated with death. No matter how long a life or an incarnation is, there's always going to be death and loss. And number two, um, many of the events and challenges of the life are associated with suffering. And so it's regarded as an unideal state of being. And plus, the soul is covered with karma, covered with impurity. It's not seeing its true nature. It's basically in this um, impure, obscured, not fully knowledgeable, uh, not fully enlightened or illuminated state of being. So it's actually a negative thing to be trapped in samsara. So according to Jains, the soul in itself, in its true nature, is all-knowing, omniscient, and it's in a state of absolute bliss or ananda. But the souls are trapped in samsara because they're not aware of their true nature. They lack that jnana, that knowledge. But if you attain the knowledge of your true nature, then you can attain release from samsara. So there are different states of being. Uh, many or most souls are in bandha or bondage. So this is uh, the normal state, so to speak, that we're in. We're a soul in a body 
um, and we have karma that obscures our soul and keeps us trapped here. An enlightened being is one who's attained all knowingness and has purified themselves of karma. This is the state of kevala jnana, or that aloneness knowledge. So it includes the pure and simultaneous knowledge of all things, including the self nature of the soul as conscious, as blissful, etc. Um, and there's no more karmas or impurity of any kind that are stuck to the soul. But a being can attain kevala jnana while they're still alive in their last body. They will not be reborn into a new body. So after their last body dies, then they're in the uh, final state of liberation or moksha or nirvana. So this is a state of absolute purity and perfection. They no longer even have that last body, that foothold in samsara. They are now completely free. Um, and you could also talk about different kinds of beings that correspond to these different states of being. So um, Kevalins are beings who have attained that state of enlightenment or Kevalagiana. And Arhant is, means a worthy one. It has the same basic meaning as a Kevalin. Whereas a Jina is an Arhant who has performed the role of a religious teacher. So the 24 Jinas are different from other beings that are free from samsara because of their cosmic role as teachers. They teach the moksha marg, the path to moksha, to all the other souls that are trapped in samsara. And because they reintroduce the teaching, their cosmic significance makes them, in a sense, on a different level spiritually than just an ordinary arhant, even though the ordinary arhants are very rare and very privileged. A siddha is a soul that has attained moksha and so has totally transcended samsara. They've let go of their last body. So what is the nature of the bondage of the soul? It's connected to karma, according to Jainism. Jainism conceives of karma as a physical matter. It's very small, very fine. It's too small to see with the naked eye, but it is matter all the same, and it sticks to the soul, basically making it dirty, um, covering over its surface so it's no longer the glowing luminous thing that it is in its true inner nature rather it's crudded over with all of these defilements so Jains use this word asrava or influx to refer to the process by which karma is attracted to the soul it flows into the soul from the ambient environment and the cause of this influx is the passions of the soul so um, the word karma literally means action. It's from the word kur in Sanskrit that means um, to act. But the Jain idea is that mental, verbal, and physical actions, the real problem is that they're caused by these passions. And so the outward or observable actions um, are occasions for karma to be attracted to the soul through this process of influx. And the karma then sticks or binds to the soul, bandha, and covers it over, hiding its true nature. It's compared to a layer of dust or dirt on a mirror. The mirror can reflect accurately when its surface is perfectly clean, but the more dust and dirt on the surface of the mirror, the less it shines, the less it reflects, the less you can use it to see things. And so that's regarded as a metaphor for the nature of a soul being covered by this karma. Now, karmas can either be pleasant or unpleasant, but they're both regarded as dangerous because both obscure the soul and keep it trapped in samsara. There's the giant image shown on the slide of a person licking honey off a sword. So the honey is the sweetness or the pleasant side of karma. The, short, the sword's sharpness, which can cut the tongue, is the painful or unpleasant side of karma. But you shouldn't pursue the pleasure. Not only does the pleasure go together with the pain in the cycle of samsara, but even if hypothetically you could get pure pleasure, you'd still be stuck in samsara. You wouldn't have the deeper bliss of moksha. And so that's kind of the goal of Jainism to end the karmas, to attain moksha. 
So this concept of kashaya or passion is also important because it's the inner state that attracts the physical karmas to the soul. Um, and the cause of kashaya is itself attachments um, to things in samsara. Uh, Jains classify kashayas into four types, krodha or anger, lobha or greed, mana, pride or ego, and maya or deceit. So these are kind of like the root causes of the bondage of the soul. So when karma sticks to the soul, it also will eventually develop, mature, and produce an effect, which is going to be some manifestation that occurs, whether mental, verbal, or physical, in ourselves, in our environment, or both. So this is the idea which Jainism shares with Hinduism and Buddhism, that karma can affect future consequence, the fruit or the result that is experienced. Um, so, and this is true regardless of whether it's a pleasant or an unpleasant result, the karma will stick to the soul, will keep it obscured and bound. That determines a person's experiences later in this life and also their next incarnation. Um, and this is kind of a self-perpetuating cycle because there's a view that attracting karma to the soul will itself lead to more karma being attracted. And so it can be very difficult to pull oneself out of this cycle. In order to attain liberation or moksha, you have to do two things. One, you have to prevent new karma from being um, attracted to the soul, so end the current passions. But you also have to purify the soul of past karma. And this can be done through meditation and through other ascetic practices. So the Jain view of liberation uh, is called moksha, um, and the path to liberation is called moksha mark, and this is the main thing taught by a jina like Mahavira, how to attain liberation. That's the goal of the religion. Connected to the belief in the liberation of the soul is a belief in free will, because without free will, there'd be no ability of the soul to get rid of its impurities and to stop attracting more karma. Only because the soul has free will and intellect can it choose its actions, choose its inner state, choose to end the passions, for example. Um, and even if the soul is completely covered and um, made dirty from its karma, this still does not eliminate the soul's free will or its intellect. So it always has the capacity to attain moksha, at least in principle. Um, and gene practices are generally aimed at controlling the type and amount of karma that attaches to the soul. Um, they also have a classification scheme. Different types of karma have different colors, and thus they can literally color your soul different ways based on the main type of karma that you're attracting. So uh, the moksha marga path to liberation um, is shown, the way is shown by Mahavira and the other jinas. But Mahavira cannot liberate or save the souls. Rather, every soul has to take responsibility for its own salvation because it's the author of its own passions. It's attracting its own karma. So Mahavira is a savior in the sense that he shows the way to moksha, but the souls have to follow the way and walk it themselves, basically. Um, Jains believe that only ascetics can attain moksha, although lay people can make some spiritual progress on the 14 stages of purity or the gunastanas. Now, Digambara Jains only allow men to become ascetics, and thus, in their view, only men can attain moksha, because all Jains agree that the ascetic lifestyle is a necessary condition for attaining moksha, whereas the Shwedambara Jains allow women to become ascetics, as appears to have been the original practice in the time of Mahavira, and they believe that uh, women can therefore also attain moksha, provided that they are ascetics. So there are 14 uh, stages or gunasthanas of the moksha marg. I'm not going to go through all of them, just a couple. The fourth stage um, is called samyak darshana. Um, these stages have other names as well, uh, which means true or complete vision. So this is a stage that is possible for a lay person. It's when they make a strong personal commitment to Jainism, and they may experience a communion with their soul, a kind of vision of their soul's true nature. 
The fifth stage is called Anivratis, which means the vows taken by lay people to live in accordance with the Jain principles. The sixth stage is the Mahavratas, or great vows taken by ascetics. Um, jumping ahead, the 13th stage is Kevalagyana. This is the state of enlightenment or omniscience, in which all of the karma has been expelled from the soul. But the 14th stage after that is Moksha, which is where the last body has been exhausted and is thrown aside. Um, even though the path is in some sense still open to become a Siddha, to attain the state of moksha, Jains believe it's now only possible to reach the seventh stage of the Gunastanas, again, because of that notion of the cosmic decline. We're in the downgrade part of the cycle when the suffering and the sin tend to increase. So either we can hang on, wait for this, our soul to be reborn in the later part of the next cycle, or there's also a view that you can pray to be reborn in another part of the cosmos that is free of this cosmic cycle and get the teachings of Moksha Mark from another Jina and then attain Moksha that way. So in Jainism, they mainly worship the Jinas, the great teachers of liberation, Moksha Marg, and the great ones to attain Moksha Marg in their era, in their time. Um, they do believe in gods and goddesses, I'll get to that in a moment, but one of the biggest differences between Jains and most Hindus is that Jains do not believe in Brahman or a supreme being. They don't believe in a single all-powerful creator god. Rather, they believe in an essentially infinite number of immortal souls. You could say each soul is godlike and that it's eternal, it's blissful, it's all-knowing in its true nature. But each one of us is or has a soul. And so each one of us has the potential to be and experience fully that inherent divine nature, you might say, divinity, eternity, uh, immortality, blissfulness, all-knowingness, depending on how you want to describe it. But there's no one soul or Brahman that's the creator of the others or that's regarded as supreme. All of those souls have just existed from eternity, but at some point they got trapped in samsara. Um, so who do they worship in Jainism if not a god or a supreme being? Well, first of all, they do believe in gods and goddesses, devas and devis, including Indra, the king of the gods, according to Hinduism, which we mentioned earlier, but these beings are of secondary significance. You can go to Jain temples and see murtis or images of gods and goddesses, and Jains will sometimes go to Hindu temples and worship Hindu gods and goddesses. These are beings that can give you blessings within samsara, but for the most part, they are inferior to the jinas, uh, who were all of human birth because the jinas teach the moksha mark, the path to liberation. So apart from the lesser status of these gods and goddesses, there are five main beings that are worthy of worship in Jainism. And this is called the Panchnamskara Mantra. This is a mantra or chant honoring these five types of beings. First of all, the Siddhas or fully liberated beings who've shed their last body and are experiencing moksha. Secondly, the Arhants or the liberated beings that are still embodied. Thirdly, the Acharyas, who are the great teachers of Jainism. Fourthly, the ascetics, who also function as teachers. And fifthly, just the larger group of all ascetics, regardless of whether they have a teaching vocation. So you'll notice that the five types of beings honored are all humans, or their last embodied existence was as a human. Um, so Jains, in a way, they do give honor to some gods, like another example is the goddess Maru Devi, who was actually the mother of a previous uh, Jina. But the main beings um, are humans because Jains believe that it's only possible to attain moksha from a human birth. So a god, even if they are a follower of a Jina, they have to be uh, waiting to be reborn as a human before they can become fully liberated. So they're not actually there on that list of the five beings worthy of worship. So a bit more about the giant view of souls. They are called Jiva or Atman. They're immaterial, eternal, and conscious or sentient. The soul in its true nature is blissful, but only liberated souls, souls in the state of moksha, fully experience the soul's intrinsic bliss. 
That's why we don't go running around in samsara feeling blissful all the time, or omniscient for that matter. So the main type of existence apart from souls is physical or material bodies, and these cannot think or act unless they are inhabited by a soul. So this is the main difference between souls and everything else. Only souls are conscious or sentient. However, there are ensouled beings. These are uh, bodies that are occupied or inhabited by a soul. And all living beings, including plants and animals, for example, have souls. Jains divide up living beings into four main types of existences or incarnations. Number one is hell beings at the bottom of reality. These are beings that are being tormented because of their past sins or bad karma. Number two is plants and animals. Number three is humans. And number four is celestial or heavenly beings. Celestial beings are the gods, goddesses, and other beings living with them in the heavens. These are beings who have great um, virtue and power. They have this exalted state, which is very pleasant because of their past good karma. But in some ways, they are inferior to a human birth because it is not possible to attain moksha while um, embodied as a celestial being. Um, so these bodies uh, of living creatures have different shapes and sizes. You know, there are some that are regarded as tiny, even microscopic by giants. But the giant belief is that the souls, um, it's not like they're bigger or smaller when they inhabit a different body. Rather, they just spontaneously expand or shrink to fit their body. And the metaphor that is used is a light, like a candle or a lamp, that will expand to fill the room or space in which it's placed. So according to Jains, when a living being dies, their soul is immediately reincarnated into another body. And so the cycle basically just continues unless you're able to follow those gunastanas, the stages of purity, and reach moksha. Jain ethics features strict nonviolence. So all living beings are regarded as containing souls, and every soul has the same intrinsic nature. Every soul is equal in the regard of being eternal, conscious, blissful, and omniscient. So um, we basically should treat all living beings with equal respect, according to Jains. We should not harm or kill any of them. Um, and furthermore, they say each one of us has been through essentially countless incarnations, including all the different types of living beings. And you can see from the diagram on the slide that uh, giants have an elaborate system of classification of different types of living creatures based on the number and types of faculties they have, as well as whether they are mobile or immobile. By the way, almost all of the images that I've taken from these slides are from Wikimedia which is very convenient for me so I don't accidentally risk violating someone's copyright or intellectual property. Um, so yeah, I do recommend using them as a resource to find additional images. Um, just thought I would note that. So the principle of Ahimsa is probably what Jainism is most famous for ethically. So they regard that harming or killing any type of living being, even an insect, even something microscopic, causes an influx of karma into one's soul. And especially harm or murder is the worst type of impurity. If you kill a living creature, you can easily be reborn into a hell realm where you'll be tortured for a very long time. So giants all practice uh, vegetarianism, although they do uh, permit the eating of dairy foods as long as the um, animals involved have not been harmed or killed, but they don't eat eggs, which is regarded as taking a life or a potential life. So they are lacto-vegetarians. And this type of vegetarianism, which probably started with Jainism, um, has since spread in the last couple thousand years to Hindus as well. So some Hindus, especially Vaishnavas and Brahmins, will also practice the lacto-vegetarianism of the same kind as the Jains. So Jain metaphysics um, is dualistic. There are those two main types of being that I mentioned consciousness which is a feature of souls and everything else so non-conscious being includes most obviously matter but also any other kind of thing that's not conscious such as space time motion and non-motion 
So matter has different shapes, colors, tastes, smells, and densities. It's believed to be permanent, so it's neither created nor destroyed in an absolute sense. It is made of teeny tiny atoms that are so small you can't see that just get rearranged in different combinations. Um, this aspect of Jainism is similar to the modern view of the elements in physics and chemistry, although the details are all completely different. Um, it's similar in its philosophical aspect to the atomism developed also by the ancient Greeks around the same time. Um, but material objects apart from the atoms are temporary and that most material objects that we interact with are not individual atoms, which are indestructible, indivisible, but rather combinations, um, collections of atoms. And these are the things that are constantly changing, constantly being broken down and put back together. Um, and this impermanence is part of the reason why samsara is such a suffering-filled and unsatisfactory place. The picture on the slide is of the six lesias or colors of the soul. And this is based on the idea that karma has different colors to it and karma being the type of matter that sticks to the soul, it can actually change the color of the soul depending on the passions. So different passions or states of the soul will preferentially attract different colors of karma. And so each soul will kind of have its own color of sin or impurity, if you will, based on these leshias. Jains have an elaborate cosmology, which is similar in broad outline to that of Hinduism and Buddhism, although the details do vary. So the cosmos or universe is regarded as uncreated and eternal, of finite size, but very, very large or vast. The shape of the cosmos is compared either to two drums balanced on top of each other, or to a human figure with legs apart and hands on hips, as you can see on the side. So there's an upper, middle, and lower part of the person, an upper, middle, and lower part of the cosmos. Now above or outside of the cosmos is the Siddha Loka, the Loka, the world, the realm of the Siddhas or liberated beings. This is the place, so to speak, where the liberated souls dwell. They have no karma, no impurities, and they're just enjoying the bliss of moksha for eternity. And they don't interact with the realm of samsara anymore. All the other realms are within the cosmos, which is samsara proper. The upper realms are the heavens. There's seven of them. They're above the middle world or Madhya Loka. And the heavens are home to the devas, the devis, the gods and goddesses, and other celestial beings. They live pleasant existences of luxury due to the good karma they accrued in past lives. But it's still not an ideal state of existence because they're still trapped in samsara. They still have to attain liberation. And in fact, they have to be reborn at least once as a human and probably more times before they can get free. The middle realm is the Madhya Loka. This is where humans and other animals live. And this is a middle realm in terms of pleasure and pain, um, you know, comfort or bliss and torture. But it is nice in that it's the only realm from which liberation or moksha is possible, according to Jains. And the lower part of the cosmos is the seven hell realms. These are where hell beings are suffering tortures due to the bad karma they accrued in their past existences. Um, and the picture on the left is of the seven hell realms. You can see some of the torments that the souls are undergoing. And the basic idea is you are reborn into a different hell realm based on your primary sins. And you'll have tortures that are kind of like appropriate compensation, so to speak, cosmically based on your previous experience. Now, do note that like in Buddhism and in Hinduism for the most part, the rebirth due to karma is not regarded as something that's created by a god or enforced by a god or gods. It's just the way that the universe works. It is a kind of natural law that certain actions or impurities will cause the soul to be reborn in certain ways. And the only thing you can do is basically learn how to end the karma to escape this cycle. So speaking of cosmic cycle, the Jains, like Hindus and Buddhists, have a cyclical view of time that goes 
uh, in a cycle or wheel endlessly. So there's no end. It would only end hypothetically if all of the souls were liberated from the cosmos or universe. Then the universe would cease to be. But otherwise, this is a perpetual cycle of 12 phases. It's like a wheel constantly spinning around. The cycle is divided into two half cycles, each of which is of six phases. The first six are phases of ascent or progress, where the Madhya Loka, the middle world of humanity, becomes increasingly spiritual and human suffering actually decreases. But the next six phases are of descent or decline or degradation, where spiritual purity declines, sin and suffering increase. So the genas are always going to be born in certain phases of this cycle. There's going to be a total of 24 genas in uh, the Madhya Loka during the third and fourth phases of each of those two half cycles. And so liberation is only possible during the third and fourth phases of each half cycle when the genas have been born and are preaching the Moksha Mark. In the other phases of the half cycle, souls are either suffering too much to actually fully believe in the possibility of liberation, or they are so content because of the relative lack of suffering that they don't see the necessity for liberation from samsara. So our world, um, our cosmos, entered the fifth phase of the descending cycle after Mahavira's death. And there's also another place called Mahavideha, which is a region or part of the Madhya Loka, the middle world. But this is the only part of the cosmos that's in its kind of own little bubble. It's outside of the cycle of ascent and descent. And the Jain belief is there's always one Jina in Mahavideha. Currently, it's Simadar Swami, who's preaching the uh, Moksha Marg. And so if a uh, person exerts enough or the right kind of religious effort, their soul can be reborn in Mahavideha get the teaching of Moksha Marg from Samadhar Swami and thus attain Moksha that way. But otherwise, in our ordinary um, human lives in Madhya Loka, you can no longer attain Moksha directly. Chapter 28, Worship and Festivals. So the main forms of Jain worship are veneration of Jinas or ascetics. So lay people in Jainism often venerate living ascetics, um, and the ascetics themselves will venerate their seniors or superiors. So in the Panch Namskara mantra that we went over previously, you'll notice that ascetics, including living ones, are on that list of five beings worthy of veneration, and it goes all the way up to the siddhas, which include all of the previous jinas. Um, and ascetics are venerated because they're generally more advanced on the moksha marg. They're living the teaching, they're purifying themselves of karma much more successfully than even the most a pious lay person just because they have a different lifestyle. Um, there's also Guru Vardhan, which is the right of veneration of a guru or teacher. So a jain will buy, uh, bow twice to the ground, they will recite a prayer, and then the ascetic uh, will typically offer them a blessing. And devout Jains practice Guru Vardhan every day. Um, probably most Jains don't quite do that often, um, but some Jains venerate a particular ascetic as their personal guru as well. So the Jains practice veneration of the Jinas, not just living ascetics. The Jain word for veneration or worship or prayer is puja, similar to Hinduism and Buddhism. But in Jainism, puja usually refers to worshiping the jinas. So these are the beings, as previously discussed, who attained moksha and taught the moksha marg or path to moksha. So that's how they're different from other um, enlightened or liberated beings. They serve that role as a universal or cosmic teacher of the moksha marg. Um, so most Jains practice worship of murtis or images in temples or shrines. So um, these are going to be depictions usually of Mahavira, but there's other genas as well. It could be any of the 24. It can be even other beings. The second most common one after Mahavira is Parshva or Parshvana, the 23rd uh, gina of the current cosmic cycle. And oftentimes those figures look very alike just based on the physical traits of their body. So usually a male with a nude body who's in a seated or standing position Rather, they are identified by the little symbol at their base. So a cobra with a hood 
is a symbol of Parshvana. A lion means the figure is Mahavira, for example. Um, so with the Digambara images, they're always going to be plain naked figures. Whereas with the Shwedambara Murtis, they're often dressed in regal clothes and jewels. They look like kings or nobles because of the Jain belief that um, all of their genas were born as Kshatriyas or nobles. Although technically depicting them as such means that you're looking at the period from before when they became an ascetic. Um, but that's just the kind of iconographical tradition we see in Shwedambara Jainism. Um, it's similar, by the way, to some Buddhist depictions of bodhisattvas uh, dressed as kings or nobles. So there are also some Jains that don't use murtis or images at all. Uh, this is called an iconic, no icons, um, because they believe the practice was not approved by the jinas. And historically, that's probably correct based on my understanding. Um, it's not clear that Mahavira ever taught that you should worship or venerate images. It was a custom or practice picked up by later Jains, possibly under influence of Hinduism and Buddhism, although most Jains do practice it today. So the aniconic sects are among the Shwedambara, the Terapanthi, and uh, Sanakvasi, and among the Digambara, the uh, Tarnapanthi sect. And instead of worshiping images, uh, these giants will worship the teaching of the genus through chanting, meditation, and studying their scriptures in special halls that are built near the dwellings of their ascetics. So giant temples are at least a couple thousand years old. Um, they probably weren't the earliest form of their religion, which was focused on these wandering ascetics who people would give offerings to when they met them. But at some point, um, maybe modeled after Hindu or Buddhist temples, giants started building temples. Um, it was probably all happening around the same period in all three religions uh, in truth. And furthermore, the architectural style of Jain temples, including in southern India, had a big impact on Buddhist and Hindu temples as well. So the development of the temple-based worship was probably something where all three religions influenced each other, just historically speaking. But Jain temples often have very ornate decorations. There's usually a central murti or image that's the focal point, but large temples especially may have many murtis of other jinas and even of gods or goddesses. So most of the temple puja is actually not the whole congregation doing it together. Some of the practices, the worship practices or puja that's done at temple includes darshan. That's looking at uh, the murti or image of a jina, especially with an attitude of devotion and humility. Um, arti, which is the one shown in the picture, is usually performed in the evening. So this is an offering of lights or candles that are placed on a tray. The tray is waved clockwise in circles before an image of a jina, all while singing devotional hymns. And then there's also the puja or prayer of eight substances, which is honoring the image of a jina, and it has eight main parts, which we'll discuss in the next couple of slides. So the puja of eight substances is usually performed in the morning after bathing. The worshiper first enters the temple, bows before the image of Ajina, and says Nishi, which means abandonment. Secondly, the worshiper circumambulates, that means walks around, the image, the Murti, three times clockwise. Thirdly, um, in this is performed differently by Shwedambara and Digambara Jains, Shwedambara Jains will anoint the Murti, the image, with milk mixed with water, recite prayers, and apply camphor and sandalwood paste, to nine parts of the murti with the third finger of the right hand and in a particular order, namely left and right big toes, right and left knees, right and left wrists, right and left shoulders, crown, forehead, throat, chest, and navel. Whereas Digambara giants do not touch the murti, the image, but rather sit before it and pour water while reciting prayers. And that was all step three. Step four, the worshiper places a fresh flower by the murti and wafts incense in a circle and then a camphor lamp. These are ways of giving offerings to the murti. Fifthly, the worshiper performs a joyous dance before the murti and waves a yak tail fan. Sixthly, the worshiper observes the murti's reflection in a handheld mirror. Seventhly, the worshiper places a handful of dry rice on a plate formed in the shape of a swastika, and that's the Part of it you can see in the image on the right. 
And the swastika is an image of blessedness or good fortune in Jainism. It's also used that way, by the way, in Hinduism and Buddhism. So you'll often see giant icons that have the swastika. The meaning has nothing to do with that um, kind of appropriated, if you will, by the Nazis and some other groups in the 20th century. Um, they got it from Indian culture, but obviously they changed the meaning. It basically just means blessedness or good fortune. So specifically in Jainism, the swastika means the four possible incarnations or states of birth, human, animal, heavenly being, or hell being. Also on the plate are placed foods such as sweets, fruits, and nuts, and sometimes money as well is placed on the rice formed into the swastika. And then the eighth and final step of the puja of eight substances is the worshiper says nishi again and may spend additional time in contemplation and then they sound a bell upon departing. So the jinas are regarded as having transcended samsara. If you think about that, it means they're not going to interact with the souls that are still trapped in samsara. So when Jains pray to or worship the Jinas, uh, according to their own um, philosophy or metaphysics, the Jinas are technically not going to respond to them. But nevertheless, the practice is regarded as beneficial. So in worshiping and praising the Jinas, Jains feel intense love and devotion. And this attitude of love and devotion for the state of liberation is itself spiritually uplifting. So the devotional attitude of the worshiper in Jainism can be more important than the precise form of the ritual because that's the inner transformation that's helping to purify the soul. Um, the ritual offerings and the gestures uh, are, are regarded not as something that would you know, practically benefit the Jinas who are kind of beyond samsara, so they're not going to be able to directly or literally benefit from a flower or from incense or from a candle, but rather their gestures of renunciation, giving up something of value. Now, ascetics are not allowed to perform the temple rituals um, because they have nothing to offer or to renounce. So most of those rituals are going to be performed by the lay people. The picture on the slide is just of the 24 genas of the current cosmic cycle. And you'll often see these um, 24 depicted and honored in Jain temples. So Jain festivals are one of the big times when Jains worship together as a community. Um, they often celebrate events in the life of Mahavira or other genas. For example, Mahavira Jayanti which is celebrated in March and or April, depending on the year. They use a lunar calendar similar to that of the Hindus. So where it falls on the modern solar calendar is going to switch from year to year. But this celebrates the birthday, uh, Jayanti, of Mahavira. And Jains actually do share some holidays with Hindus, like Diwali or Dipavali, but they interpret them differently. So Diwali will usually take place in October. For Jains, it marks the new year both of their uh, ritual or liturgy, but also of their commerce. So it's like fiscal uh, new year and celebrates Mahavira's moksha, but also that of his disciple Gotama, the enlightenment rather of Gotama, who was able to overcome his attachment a few hours after the death of Mahavira. But like in Hinduism, Diwali is celebrated by Jains as a festival of light. So you can see in the picture a light offering being given before a murti of a jina. So um, there's some differences in the festivals between Shwedambaras and Digambaras. Shwedambaras celebrate Pariyushan, which means abiding. It's a festival that occurs in August or September and it lasts for eight days. So one of the main practices of the festival is fasting. Fasting is regarded as one of the best forms of renunciation and a way to purify the soul of its attachments. Practically speaking, more Jain women than men will practice the fasting any given year. Men who have to work a lot will often say that interferes with their fulfilling the fast. But in Jainism, they do esteem the fast a lot. The longer or more arduous, the better. There are other practices, though, during Pari Ushan, including attending the temple frequently. Uh, lay people may also take temporary vows, so they'll live as ascetics just for that period of the festival. 
and they may perform pilgrimage to a holy site such as Mount uh, Shravanjaya in Gujarat or Shravana Belagola in Karnataka. So the days one to three of this festival feature daily sermons. Um, during the end of the festival day, days four to eight, there's actually twice daily sermons. Um, on the fourth through seventh days of the festival specifically, there's a public reading of the Kalpa Sutra, which is the Shwedambara scripture that contains the life of Mahavira and the histories of all 24 genus. So it's kind of like a world or universal history. Uh, on day five of the festival is the story of Mahavira's birth with elaborate ritual and celebration. And on day eight of the festival, there is a feast, so the end of the fasting period, plus uh, Pratikraman, which is a congregational ritual in which communal atonement and repentance for any harmful actions during the past year is practiced. Um, it's also true that more pious giants will have a Pratikraman uh, practice daily. So the end of the festival is also um, accompanied with the practice of sending cards to relatives and friends, seeking forgiveness for any wrongdoing from the past year. So the giant idea is you don't hold grudges over the past year. So this is kind of like a uh, festival of atonement and repentance. It clears the slate and to try to keep the, the soul pure for the coming year. Digambaras have an equivalent festival called uh, Dasha Lakshana Parva, the festival of 10 religious qualities. And this lasts for 10 days. Um, over the 10 day period, 10 chapters of the Tatvarta Sutra are recited. Lay people take a very active role. In um, Digambara Jainism, there are fewer ascetics in part because of the requirement um, to not have clothes. It's just an even more rigorous lifestyle, and that's partly why there are fewer Digambara ascetics. Um, and near the end of the festival, there is puja or worship to Ananta, who's the 14th Jina, and that's in the form of flowers. Um, and then on day 10, there are rites of atonement similar to those practiced by Shwedambara giants in their Pariushan festival. So a bit more about the practices of giant ascetics. They are dedicating their entire lives to making spiritual progress towards moksha. They're not allowed to have any worldly possessions, except for those necessary to live as an ascetic, which traditionally were three in number. A whisk that they could use to brush the ground in front of them so as to not accidentally step on an insect or small creature, which would still have a soul. A water pot and shastras or scriptures. And they're supposed to renounce anything that would be pleasing to the senses or comfortable, including tasty foods, comfortable or luxurious dwellings, etc. And as mentioned before, the Digambara ascetics do not wear clothing, hence the name sky clad. They're only wearing the sky, the air, i.e. nothing. Now, because in India it is and has been socially unacceptable for women to be naked, only men have been allowed to be Digambara ascetics. And that's also why Digambaras think that only men can attain moksha, because you need to have that ascetic lifestyle. Um, the Shwedambara giants, uh, they wear seamless white robes. Um, they also carry a bowl for their alms, and their broom is made from naturally shed cow tail hairs. And they also often have a face covering to avoid accidentally breathing in insects or other small microscopic creatures. The five vows or Mahavratas are taken by ascetics. Ahimsa, which means not harming or nonviolence. This means not killing or hurting any living and sold creature. Satya means truth or honesty, so it's never telling a lie. Um, and actually, the fact that um, lay people in Jainism also often take some of these vows has meant traditionally that giant merchants are very well trusted in Indian culture because they're very scrupulous in adhering not only to nonviolence, but also to honesty. So they won't try to cheat you. The third of the great vows is asteya, which means not stealing, um, not taking anything that's not offered to you. The fourth of the great vows is brahmacharya, which means celibacy or chastity. So uh, giant ascetics, of course, are not allowed to have any sexual activity or conduct at all. And then the fifth of the great vows is aparigraha, which means not grasping or non-attachment. So uh, Jain 
nonviolence includes vegetarianism, not harming any living thing, including tiny and invisible organisms. So for example, giants are not supposed to kill insects. You're not supposed to use pesticides. Um, and you can just get a sense of how much this might transform your life if you try to live it out consistently. Chapter 29, Jainism in the Modern World. So, of course, as with many other religions, Jainism has changed somewhat in the last few centuries due to the rise of modern science, technology, modern politics, and social conditions. Jain ascetics, another part of their ascetic vow, is they're only allowed to travel on foot. This means that, practically speaking, most of them do not leave India. Uh, and because ascetics play an important part in the religion, important role, this has somewhat restricted the extent to which Jainism can spread outside of India. Um, however, there was an ancient practice that um, has changed. The traveling on foot is still there, practiced by modern ascetics, but formerly it was common for children to take ascetic vows, uh, but that is no longer practiced. And nowadays, giant ascetics generally make the decision to live that way for the rest of their lives after attaining adulthood. Um, so in terms of giant doctrines, some of them have been integrated by giants or brought into dialogue, you might say, with modern views, ideologies, or movements. An example is giant vegetarianism. The fact that giants were an early adopter of vegetarianism and the ethical principles associated with it has been used by some giants to promote their religion as being something that's you know more morally enlightened as being ahead of the curve compared to a lot of other cultures or civilizations or religions some giants have also pointed to the similarities between the giant atomistic metaphysics and modern physics as scientific proof for the precepts of their religion. The details of Jain cosmology with the different heavenly realms, hell realms, Mount Meru, and so on, of course, conflicts with the modern scientific cosmology, however. Um, Jain practices uh, are largely the same as they were traditionally, um, but they've Jains have had to make decisions about how to apply them to the modern era. So for example, some Jain teachers won't use microphones because of concern that electric currents could harm tiny airborne creatures. Um, another difference is that the Jain scriptures are now generally more available to lay people and to non-Jains than they were historically. So they're not the exclusive preserve of Jain ascetics anymore. Um, and there was also the traditional custom of not eating after dark. The reason why giants practiced this was because it was regarded as more likely to accidentally eat or harm an insect or another small creature um, during the night. But now with modern electrical lighting, the risk no longer exists. And so giants have to make a decision. Will they continue to follow the practice, but with a different justification, uh, basically just tradition, or will they um, abandon the practice or adapt it to the modern situation? Um, there also are, for example, some modern Jain educational institutions. Acharya Tulsi, uh, shown in the picture on the slide, established the first Jain university in 1970 in Rajasthan. So this is just another example of modern institutions being founded by Jains, a bit of a adaptation to modern social conditions, if you will. Um, most giants live in India. There's around four to five million giants worldwide. There's between one and 200,000 giants outside of India, many in North America and, and well, other countries as well, uh, Britain. Um, so in the 1800s, there were actually a fairly significant number of giants in Eastern Africa. This was basically because of the existence of the British Empire. Um, the British controlled India at that time. They also controlled uh, many parts of East Africa, the modern nations of Kenya, for example. Um, and they encouraged some people from India to move to East Africa and some of their other colonies as well, such as Guyana on the north coast of South America, South Africa, etc., to take on administrative positions in some of their other colonies or to serve as merchants just to do other productive work for those colonies. And so there were small communities of giants in Kenya, um, in former British East Africa. So for example, they built a temple 
in Nairobi in 1926, and another temple in Mombasa, also in Eastern Africa, in 1963. But this community uh, no longer really exists anymore. Um, they were persecuted in the 1960s and 1970s, unfortunately, by the newly independent post-colonial East African regimes. When the British Empire uh, gave up most of its colonies in the post-World War II period, especially the 1960s and 70s, some of those former colonies in Africa became more uh, nationalistic and became concerned with populations of what they perceived as foreigners, like the Indians, who had arrived there during the British colonial era. So some of them were hostile towards Indians, regarded them as being exploitative merchants and so on. So many of those families had to leave. They fled to Britain and to Canada and the United States for the most part. So there are um, small but fairly significant numbers of Jains uh, outside of India. Because the Jain ascetics are not allowed to travel um, except by foot, that means that the way they practice the religion is a bit different. And many Jains in the diaspora like to travel to India to be in the pr presence of ascetics, to hear their teaching, to go on pilgrimage, etc. The picture is from a Jain center of America in New York City, the United States. And you'll notice all the people there are lay people. So that suffices for our brief summary of Jainism. Next up in the textbook is part seven, Judaism. Although if you are taking my class, we're gonna move on to part four, Buddhism instead, which follows the more logical progression. The last two chapters were Hinduism uh, and then Jainism. So now we're moving on to a third Indian religion, Buddhism. Either way, until next time.